Good morning. Welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Laura, and I'm the discipleship pastor here at the Methodist Church of Anoka. I'm so glad that each one of you could join us this morning for worship. I hope that it is a time uh, where you feel closer to God and you're brought into a worshipful experience. So at this time, I would like to invite you to participate in our call to worship. The words will be on the screen. Easter is not a moment. Easter is more than a holiday. Easter is an adventure that is always just begun. Easter is the ground that holds us up and together. As long as Christians come to worship, the story of Easter continues to be written. We are the characters in God's story. We live in the arc of time and space only God completely understands. We join people from many times and places to follow Jesus here and now. Easter is a season of wild hope. When we remember that with God, anything is possible. Today, we continue the journey. We re-enter the story to explore our questions, to uncover our doubts, to face the unsettled spaces of our spirits. May Jesus join us here. Our worship begins. Oh 
1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. See what kind of love the Father has given to us in that we should be called God's children. And that is what we are. Because the world didn't recognize him, it doesn't recognize us. Dear friends, now we are God's children, and it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. While they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were terrified and afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you startled? Why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It's really me. Touch me and see for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. As he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Because they were wondering and questioning in the midst of their happiness, he said to them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. Taking it, he ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law from Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, This is what is written. The, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Hallelujah.
Good morning. This week, I'm recording our Sunday sermon on Saturday afternoon, and I'm sitting in my backyard. This, for me, is a place of calm. It's a place of peace. This is where I come to sit, even when it's sometimes a little bit too chilly, with a cup of tea and a cozy blanket and a good book. This is where I come to take deep breaths. This is where I come to watch my kids run around in the yard or shoot hoops or push each other a little too hard on the tree swing. This is where I come to hear the the peaceful sounds of my neighborhood and know that I might need space in the world, but I'm not alone. This is where I set down my phone, where there is no television, where I put away the outside world and focus on one moment at a time. And this is where I come when I want to ask the Holy Spirit to meet me and to speak to me and to comfort me. A couple of weeks ago, John added a new feature to our backyard, the bird feeder camera. Now, even when I can't be out here in the yard in the gazebo, I still get regular reminders throughout the day that the Holy Spirit is here. Do you have a place like this? A place where you go when you need a pause or a reset, when you need some time and space to get in touch with what you're feeling. A place where you go so that you can go deeper, so that you can confront what God is speaking into you. Today in our scripture reading, we encounter the original disciples, the first followers of Jesus in just such a space. They have been gathered together in Jerusalem, hiding out, getting bits and pieces of news and rumors of Jesus' sightings in the area. Biblical scholar Barbara J. Essex describes what Luke tells us about the disciples in these days just following the crucifixion of Jesus. She writes, The disciples and others gathered in Jerusalem were immersed in chaos and confusion, fear, frustration, guilt, grief, doubt, anxiety, suspicion, distrust, restlessness, despondency, and terror. Their leader was dead, and his bloody and wounded body was missing. A few of those who had been present at the public execution of Jesus had recently left the group to go home to Emmaus a few miles down the road. And suddenly, here they were, rushing back into Jerusalem to tell the others that they had seen Jesus. He had appeared to them on the road and he shared a meal in their home. The rumors were true. Jesus is alive. Well, it has not been too difficult this week to imagine how the disciples were feeling all of those feelings that Reverend Essex listed. They had watched Jesus, someone they believed in and valued and loved, someone who they trusted, and someone who believed in and valued and loved and trusted them, violently killed. Jesus was being branded a criminal around town, labeled as disrespectful to the status quo of religion and government authorities. His followers were being mocked, searched out, and threatened. They feared for their lives, for the lives of their families. But today, we read that there were even deeper feelings swirling among them than fear. Underneath that fear was doubt. What if the whispers were true? What if Jesus was nothing more than a disruptor, an agitator, a troublemaker, a criminal, a fraud? What if they had been wrong all along to align themselves with his radical teachings that lifted up the most despised, most discouraged, and most defeated among them? Were they foolish to believe in a Messiah who ate with sinners, who said that the lives of Samaritans were sacred, who invited the wealthy to redistribute their resources, who spoke life and healing to the undeserving? As they huddled together discussing all of these doubts and fears and wonderings and rumors, Jesus appeared to them. He spoke words that we often speak to one another in our churches even today. Peace be with you. But the immediate physical response that his presence triggered in the bodies of the disciples was anything but peace, wasn't it? The gospel writer tells us that when Jesus appeared and spoke to them, the disciples were terrified and afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. 
So also, perhaps they were feeling confused? Jesus asks them, why are you startled? What doubts are arising in your hearts? Which, I mean, really, Jesus? But he stops and he takes the time to show them his body, to help them understand, and then even to eat with them. And this is important. The body of Jesus is part of this story. The restoration of his physical body is part of the story of God's love and care for human beings in bodies. (laughs) The wounds, the scars, and the hunger of Jesus are not details to be glossed over. They're not parlor tricks to convince the disciples that he is not a ghost. Can you imagine the kinds of feelings that those wounds and scars of Jesus must have stirred up in them? The guilt and the shame that they could not or did not protect him. The anger at the unjust powers that viewed his life as expendable and reduced to the label of criminal worthy of death. It matters that Jesus did not appear as a ghost or somehow restored to a body that was healed or unmarked by what had happened to him. The scars on Jesus' body point to the place where God's saving work is centered, in bodies that have been wounded. To view the hope of resurrection requires us to first take a hard, honest look at the pain and the scars. Scholar M. T. Davila speaks about this in her commentary on this passage. She writes, God's salvific activity in the resurrection embraces and transforms unjust suffering so that the work of building the realm within history can continue among those commissioned to preach love and repentance. The work of building the beloved community takes place within history and within our wounded bodies. Negating the marks of the suffering of the oppressed among us is to make Jesus' resurrection a ghostly appearance unrelated to salvation in history. This week, there has been so much suffering among us. Since we last gathered virtually to worship last Sunday, we have experienced what has seemed like an endless barrage of news of violence. We may find ourselves like those early disciples, wanting to hide and whisper, questioning if Jesus can actually be the one whom we once believed him to be. We might find ourselves tempted to justify violence against bodies that we have named criminal or dangerous or threatening. We might be tempted to focus so much on our own discomfort that we minimize the overflowing grief and pain of our neighbors. Or we might be tempted to walk away and seek our own continued comfort rather than confront the scars that our neighbors do not have the privilege of ignoring or avoiding. When Jesus appeared to the disciples that day in Jerusalem, he opened their minds to understand how what was happening fit God's story for humanity. He showed them both physically and mentally that they were witnesses to God's saving work. Soon they would be sent out from this room, sent out from this city to bring the gospel to others. And the message would be good news. Good news. God is who God says. Jesus is alive. Good news, we don't have to live this way. God is doing so much more already. There is healing. There is belonging. There is hope. There is joy. But to get from here to there, first, the disciples have to work through all those mixed feelings they've been holding on to. Not deny them, not ignore them, and not fix them, but face them, interrogate them, take responsibility for them. The work of Jesus is about to become their work. And in order to do it well, they need to work through these emotions. In my family, we spend a lot of energy taking responsibility for our feelings. We use a simple tool called a feelings wheel. Here's an example of one. The feelings wheel is a tool that helps us put language to what is happening in our bodies and in our hearts and minds. It helps us start a conversation where we are able to be more honest with ourselves and with each other. 
Often when we choose words from the feeling wheel to share with each other about how we feel, we discover that our feelings have layers. For example, I might start with saying I am angry. But when I ask myself if there are other feelings contributing to my anger, I might realize that I am also feeling afraid and discouraged. Oh, and inadequate? Yikes. That's often a contributing feeling that factors into my anger. Maybe I'm also feeling some happiness. Maybe, like the disciples, my happiness is also coexisting with some grief or some doubt or some guilt. It's remarkable how much of a difference we experience in our relationships when we take the time to name and explore how we are feeling. And then comes the next part, when we take the time to listen and to receive the feelings of others. Because we've done the work with our own feelings, we find ourselves more ready to believe the complexities of each other's feelings. We are more open to holding each other's feelings gently and with generosity rather than with judgment or criticism or a need to fix or correct each other's feelings. Which brings me to one more tool that I'd like to share with you today, a way of considering where we go with all of our feelings, especially when we are close to a trauma or a tragedy, such as the killing of Dante Wright by police not so far from us in Brooklyn Center this week, or the impending verdict in Minneapolis, or when mass shootings, violence we once thought unthinkable and outrageous and rare, now seem to be a regular segment on the nightly news. We are going to have feelings. How will we know what to do with them or where to go with them? Well, because we are followers of Jesus, we know the mandate that is before us. As I have loved you, love one another. If we take that mandate seriously, then we need to reckon with our own feelings in ways that do not cause more pain, more harm, or more violence to the grieving and to the hurting and to the harmed. Now is the time for us to determine whether or not we are capable of pouring in love without judgment, without qualified statements, and without excuses. Black lives are sacred. Native lives are sacred. Asian lives are sacred. Trans lives are sacred. It is incumbent upon us to interrogate any hesitancy within us about naming the humanity and belovedness of others. Any fear in us that by naming their belovedness, we have somehow compromised our own. And any temptation within us to qualify the trauma of others by placing blame upon them for the unwelcome feelings that their trauma rises up and swirls within us. So here's the tool. It's a method called the ring theory. It's developed by clinical psychologist, Dr. Susan Silk. And essentially it works like this. When you are in some way connected or affected by a situation of trauma or tragedy, this tool helps to assess where to go with your feelings and where not to go with them. The goal is to offer unqualified comfort, healing and support to those who need it most. In an article about ring theory in Psychology Today, Dr. Deborah Davis describes our natural human reaction to significant traumatic or shared traumatic events. She writes, Your own pain and your desire to fix are common and well-intentioned, springing from your emotional empathy. But these particular attempts at support are inappropriate and even harmful because you essentially shift the spotlight away from the person who is suffering and put it on yourself. We do this without even realizing it. We are feeling our feelings and it can be hard to imagine others are not feeling what we are in response to a situation. We want to discuss it. We want to fix it. We want to solve it. Instead, we might try this practice of ring theory. So here's what you can do. Draw a circle. In the circle, place the name of the one person who is most impacted in this moment or situation. Then around it, draw a ring. And in that ring, write the next people who are most affected. 
add rings, add people. Many, many rings are often needed to really diagram who's affected by a trauma or a tragedy. Finally, once you've got everybody situated, locate yourself on the diagram. In some situations, you might be right in the center, and in others, you might be hundreds of rings away. Now, whenever you are facing someone who is closer to the center than you are, this is what you do. You pour in comfort and love and care and listening without judgment and time, physical or financial support, and so on. And only when you are facing someone who is farther from the center than you are, do you dump out your own feelings, wonderings, theories, opinions, judgments, and needs. In this way, we can support one another and we can build trust. We can learn from prioritizing the lived experiences and emotional responses of those who are closest to trauma and grief and loss without projecting our own unique experiences and needs onto them, but still have a realistic and safe space to talk about what we need to talk about. This week, Pastor Laura and I spent some time in Brooklyn Center with clergy from that community who have joined together every day to pray for their people and their neighborhoods and their families. We stood in silent prayer and we were witnesses as pastors, several of them black pastors from the community, shared the feelings they are holding before God and one another this week. We were witnesses to their feelings of grief and loss for the life of Dante Wright and also for other young black men in their community. We listened and received and witnessed their outrage at unjust systems their anxiety for those whose businesses and livelihoods are boarded up. We heard their pain at the turmoil and chaos night after night in their community. And we were witnesses to something else as well, to their hope, to a belief that if we are ready to look at the scars and the wounds, we might also be ready to receive Jesus's word of peace and promise that God abides in suffering. After the prayer vigil, we delivered donations from our church to their emergency community response site. We had to wait in a really long line of cars in order to make our delivery. And while we waited and inched along, we saw neighbors pouring in support and care, kindnesses, smiles, elbow taps, supplies. We saw neighbors receiving help and compassion without judgment and without qualification. Dear ones, It is hard work to dig into the conversations that make us feel vulnerable and afraid. I imagine the disciples feeling so vulnerable and afraid that day when Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection. He showed them his scars. He asked them for a meal. And then together they began to do the listening and the learning that would prepare them to go into the world as witnesses to the good news. My prayer for us today and in the days ahead is that we will challenge ourselves to similar work, to confront our feelings, to not look away from the scars, to share a meal with the hurting, and then together to begin the listening and learning that will equip us to be witnesses of the good news, providers of hope and givers and receivers of love. Or as we heard it in 1 John this morning, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we may be called the children of God, every last one of us. Amen. Please bow with me in prayer. God, once again, our neighboring community cries out to you in pain. Do not turn your back on them. How long, O God, must our black and brown citizens languish under the yoke of oppression? When will it end? When will our black and brown neighbors be safe? Safe in their beds, asleep. Safe playing in the park. Safe playing their music loud. Safe on a run. Safe on public transit. Safe in their churches. Safe going to the gas station to buy Skittles and iced tea. Safe in their backyards. Safe bird watching. Safe during a traffic stop. God, when is enough enough? 
We can't change the past, but our future can be different. Set our hearts on fire with a passion for the beloved community where all can thrive. Give us eyes to see when that is not the case and give us the courage to change. Turn us away from our consumer mindset to that of a servant that will do whatever it takes to bring justice and mercy to this world. Do not let us turn away from the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Fill us with your love, fill us with compassion, fill us with the audacity to demand a better world. And God, we know a better world is possible. After all, we follow a man born into a reality of state occupation and violence that ended in a state-sanctioned execution. Evil was thought to have won that day, but God, you had the last word. Evil will not prevail. Oppression will not go unchecked. The poor will be lifted up. The oppressed will be blessed. Make it so, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And now let us pray how your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As our service draws to an end, I would like to close with the words of Howard Thurman from his book, Meditations of the Heart. This meditation is called, Give Me the Listening Ear. And it's based on these words, give me the listening ear, the eye that is willing to see. Thurman writes, give me the listening ear. I seek this day the ear that will not shrink from the word that corrects and admonishes. The word that holds up before me, the image of myself that causes me to pause and reconsider. The word that challenges me to deeper consecration and higher resolve. The word that lays bare needs that make my own days uneasy. That seizes upon every good, decent impulse of my nature, channeling it into paths of healing in the lives of others. Give me the listening ear. I seek this day the disciplined mind, the disciplined heart, the disciplined life that makes my ear the focus of attention through which I may become mindful of expressions of life foreign to my own. I seek the stimulation that lifts me out of old ruts and established habits which keep me conscious of myself, my needs, my personal interests. Give me this day the eye that is willing to see the meaning of the ordinary, the familiar, the commonplace, the eye that is willing to see my own faults for what they are, the eye that is willing to see the likable qualities in those I may not like, the mistake in what I thought was correct, the strength in what I had labeled as weakness. Give me the eye that is willing to see that thou hast not left thyself without a witness in every living thing. Thus to walk 
with reverence and sensitivities through all the days of my life. Give me the listening ear, the eye that is willing to see. As you go to this day and to this week, go into this world as followers of Jesus, with ears open to hear challenging words, with eyes open to see the truth before us, and with hearts ready to embrace every opportunity to love God with all that we have and all that we are, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Go and provide hope to our community. Amen. Thank you.